Today, I want to talk about courage and the hypnosis of the devil. We are on part two of our two-part exploration of C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters. Last week, I talked about sex, and really I talked about love and romance as one of the central crisis points for the battle between heaven and hell over an individual human soul. Um, this week, I want to talk about courage, and courage is a topic that has been much on my mind of late, and I think a lot of people have been noticing a deficiency of courage. Um, I know that I have listeners who have a range of opinions about things like coronavirus, lockdowns, um, and I think we probably all who are involved in this show, we're, we're pretty anti things like critical race theory and, you know, woke teaching in schools. Um, but the, the thing that unites all of these issues is that in order for the spell to be broken, in order for the school to stop teaching these poisonous ideas about, you know, white people being inherently guilty uh, by birth, um, in order for the unconstitutional lockdown to end, in order for the mask mandate to be pushed aside, right, you need people to stand up and show courage. And it's not entirely politically correct to say, but there is something inherent in the nature of manhood and that makes it particularly incumbent upon men to, to show courage. And there is no substitute for it, right? When people write to me or they, they DM me and they ask, you know, how do I push back? I, I, I'm worried about you know, uh, getting a bad grade in, in college, but I want to push back against my crazy leftist professor, right? Unfortunately, there is no substitute for taking courageous action and then finding, of course, when you do, that there are many people who have been thinking, yeah, this is crazy, this is bad, but I, I didn't have the strength to speak up and now I see this person speaking up and I'm going to be courageous. I'm going to go forward, right? There is, there's just no getting around the need for that. And as we'll get to, right, um, I mentioned last week how Lewis emphasizes in the screw tape letters that your feelings <laughs> don't actually matter that much for your spiritual life. Um, and, and, one of the things that you don't need in order to be brave, you don't need to feel brave. You can do brave actions. In fact, there's an argument to be made that you are more courageous when you do the thing you know is right, even though you are scared down to your bones, even though you're terrified, right? And we need a lot more of that. People are very reticent, um, very cowed by one another and by our, uh, what I would call our ruling classes, right? The people who run our major media institutions and our, our federal government, right? People are very ready to just sort of say, well, I guess, you know, nobody's, nobody else is speaking up. So I will, you know, that, that fortitude, that manly fortitude um, is an essential ingredient of all virtue. And that's what I'm going to be arguing today, that there is no virtue without courage. So before we get into it, I'm just going to pause and say that you can start learning Latin and ancient Greek this summer with my sponsors, the Ancient Language Institute. I love these guys because they cut through a lot of the bad teaching techniques that sometimes get in the way of people learning these incredible languages. They minimize the grammar drills, the vocab lists, all of this sort of like long lists of memorization and focus on developing reading skills as soon as possible. These are languages that were meant to be read and understood. You can read Virgil, you can read Aristotle, you can read New Testament Greek with just a few semesters of study if you go to ancientlanguage.com slash youngheretics to get started. And you get 15% off if you use the offer code heretics, just like in the title, H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S. Uh, these summer semester signups will only be open for another couple weeks. They fill up really, really quickly. They take students of all ages and experience levels. So reach out to them and they will consult with you about getting you in the right class. Ancientlanguage.com slash youngheretics, ancientlanguage.com slash youngheretics, and use the offer code heretics for 15% off. Highly recommended. Alrighty, so I have argued before that courage is, a, is itself a kind of morally neutral uh virtue or a morally neutral excellence. Um, and that's because, of course, you can show courage uh, in the name of evil, just as you can show courage in the name of good. Um, but at the same time, right, and this is what Lewis really shows in the screw tape letters is at the same time, there can be no good action without courage. Um, 
And I know that's hard, right? The whole point is that it's hard. The whole point is that you're scared. And if you weren't scared, it really wouldn't be courage. Um, but one of the greatest sort of themes in the screw tape letters, one of the most beautiful um, and, and artfully constructed narratives is what I called the devil's hypnosis, the way in which you can, you know, get caught in this loop of fear and anxiety where your anxieties start to sound reasonable to you. And you can make all of these great arguments why really you shouldn't because you would, you know, you would risk so much and wouldn't it just be better to, you know, get the good grade or to not make trouble in this, you know, just keep your head down and get by, right? Um, that is what I am calling the devil's hypnosis. And in fact, it turns out that that phenomenon was the inspiration for Lewis to write the screw tape letters in the first place. This is a rare instance in which we have a really clear account from Lewis about how he came to write this book. Um, this is a letter he wrote in 1940 to his brother, uh, whose name was Warren, uh, or he was called Warney. And here's, a, here's the relevant passage. There are a couple paragraphs. Um, Humphrey, that's Lewis's doctor, Lewis says, Humphrey came up to see me last night, not in his medical capacity, so just as a friend. They also had a, a friendship, right? And we listened to Hitler's speech together. I don't know if I'm weaker than other people, but it is a positive revelation to me how while the speech lasts, it is impossible not to waver just a little. So this is during World War II. They're listening to Hitler giving a speech, right? Um, and so th he says, I, maybe I'm weaker than other people, but while I'm listening even to Hitler, whom I know to be evil, right, it is impossible not to waver just a little. He goes on, he says, I should be useless as a schoolmaster or a policeman. Statements which I know to be untrue all but convince me, at any rate, for the moment, if only the man says them unflinchingly. The same weakness is why I am a slow examiner, that is, a slow grader of, of exams. If a candidate with a bold, mature handwriting attributed paradise lost to Wordsworth, I should feel a tendency to go and look it up for fear he might be right after all. A side note, by the way, I am so relieved to have read Lewis saying this because I am the exact same way. I will hear somebody say something that I know to be false and I'm like, hmm, is that right? And I guess that's part of why I'm like an obsessive reader, right, is I'm always going back and checking things. Um, but this phenomenon of being hypnotized by somebody you know is wrong because he's a charismatic speaker, right? And he's, Lewis is listening to Hitler with his friend and thinking, oh, gosh, like I, I'm wavering. I'm, I'm wavering in my courage. I'm wavering in my commitment to the English cause, right? And the speech is basically about, well, don't get involved because you will be destroyed, right? And this idea of satanic hypnosis um, is the operating principle of the screw tape letters. And so shortly thereafter, in the same letter, he says, I have been to church for the first time for many weeks owing to the illness. He had been ill um, and considered myself invalid enough to make a midday communion. He went to a different church service than he usually did. He says, I am pleased to find, though one must not mistake the effects of habit for those of grace, that if this duty has to be omitted for several weeks, I do now feel the lack of it. Remember, he's coming back to his Christian in faith, and he's saying, I actually have a certain uh, affinity now for church, um, if only in a very low way, as one feels uncomfortable if one has postponed cutting one's nails for visiting the barber too long. Blanchette preached, this is the name of the preacher, not very profitably, uh, so he doesn't like this preacher. Before the service was over, one could wish these things came more seasonably. I was struck by an idea for a book, which I think might be both useful and entertaining. It would be called As One Devil to Another, and would consist of letters from an elderly retired devil to a young devil who has just started work on his first, quote, patient. We can now recognize this as the germ of an idea for the screw tape letters. He calls it As One Devil to Another would eventually be published, as I said before, uh, first periodically in The Guardian, um, and then as a book called The Screwtape Letters. Um, this is a remarkable insight into how this book works, right? He is basically saying the same satanic power of hypnotism that allows Hitler to make a compelling speech even though he is evil, right? Um, that same power is how the devil works on us internally, by putting things into our head. By and, and, and the reason I bring this up now when we're talking about courage is because the issue of courage, the issue of whether this uh, patient is going to do his duty in war is the place where this hypnotism operates most powerfully um, and for a while it seems effectively until the end of the book. And we're going to get to the end of the book today because this is the last episode we'll do on it for a little while. But 
let's get into the kind of way that war emerges um, and then how uh, screw tape encourages Wormwood to use the announcement of the outbreak of the Second World War um, in order eventually to damn his patient, to consign him to hell by convincing him essentially not to do his duty for his country. Okay, you guys, I am so excited about our new sponsor, the Classic Learning Test, or CLT. It's a standardized test. You've all heard of standardized tests, right? The PSAT, the SAT, the ACT, lots of us took these to get into college, and we learned whatever was on the test, right? If the ACT had said we're going to test French, we would have learned French. And they put the passages in front of you that then dictate what gets taught in schools. And guess what? The college board, which writes these tests, is super biased. So they're putting a bunch of woke passages or just bland, boring passages in front of students. The CLT is a competitor to all those other tests. They put students in front of the kinds of thinkers that we love on this show. Dostoevsky, C.S. Lewis, Jane Austen, right? All the greats. If you know a high school junior or senior, let them know about this. Tell them about the CLT. The next test date is June 19th, and you can use the discount code HERETICS, just like in the title, H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S, at cltexam.com. You'll get 20% off the registration fee. They also have an awesome podcast, the Anchored Podcast, which I've been on. You should check it out. And go to cltexam.com, offer code HERETICS for 20% off the registration fee. Okay. So in chapter five, early on, the war is announced. And here is what Screwtape says. He says, my dear Wormwood, it is a little bit disappointing to expect a detailed report on your work and to receive instead such a vague rhapsody as your last letter. You say you are delirious with joy because the European humans have started another of their wars. I see very well what has happened to you. You are not delirious. You are only drunk. Reading between the lines in your very unbalanced account of the patient's sleepless night, I can reconstruct your state of mind fairly accurately. For the first time in your career, you have tasted that wine, which is the reward of all our labors, the anguish and bewilderment of a human soul, and it has gone to your head. So he's essentially saying war has broken out, and when war breaks out, the devils feast and they dance and they delight in war because it is this horrendous thing which strikes fear and terror into men's hearts, and the patient was up all night uh, fearing, you know, what would happen now. And this is something that, that renders uh, Wormwood drunk with delight. I do not expect, Screwtape says, I do not expect old heads on young shoulders. Did the patient respond to some of your terror pictures of the future? Did you work in some good self-pitying glances at the happy past? Some fine thrills in the pit of his stomach were there? You played your violin prettily, did you? Well, well, it's all very natural. But do remember, Wormwood, that duty comes before pleasure. If any present self-indulgence on your part leads to the ultimate loss of the prey, you will be left eternally thirsting for that draft of which you are now so much enjoying your first sip. So he's saying... Wormwood delighted in kind of uh, showing these pictures of what if, right, to the to the patient as he was lying awake at night. Um, he's saying, and that's what the, you know, that's the reward of all our labors is to feast on human misery. Um, but if this patient is saved, that is, if he is, uh, it, it ends up instead, you know, going to heaven after he dies, um, then you will be miserable without that uh, delicious anguish because there will only be joy. And won't that be terrible? Um if, on the other hand, you, by steady and cool-headed application here and now, you can finally secure his soul, he will then be yours forever. A brimful living chalice of despair and horror and astonishment, which you can raise to your lips as often as you please. Lewis is very sly. Every now and then there's a sentence in this book that just fills you with the actual terror of hell, right? That is an amazing description of a human soul in hell, a brimful living chalice of despair and horror and astonishment, which you can raise to your lips as often as you please. So do not allow any temporary excitement to distract you from the real business of undermining faith and preventing the formation of virtues. Give me, without fail, in your next letter, a full account of the patient's reactions to the war so that we can consider whether you are likely to do more good by making him an extreme patriot, patriot or an ardent pacifist. There are all sorts of possibilities. In the meantime, I must warn you not to hope too much from a war. 
So this is the theme that we touched on last week that, you know, any human event, uh, whether seemingly good or seemingly bad, can be used either for the purposes of heaven or the purposes of hell. And in this case, right, we have the, an opportunity for heroism, but also an opportunity for cowardice. And, cowardice. and the, the patient's spiritual uh, status kind of hinges on how he will comport himself, how virtuously he will act um, in the context of this War um, and the uh, use of the specter of war is almost better for the the demons than the actual war. And this is something that we get again in in chapter six. He says, "My dear Wormwood, I am delighted to hear that your patient's age and profession make it possible, but by no means certain, that he will be called up for military service. We want him to be in the maximum uncertainty, so that his mind will be filled with contradictory pictures of the future, every one of which arouses hope or fear." There is nothing like suspense and anxiety for barricading a human's mind against the enemy. He wants men to be concerned with what they do. Our business is to keep them thinking about what will happen to them. So this is a wonderful picture of how anxiety works. It bars your mind from what you should be thinking about, which is what God wants of you, right? What is good? What do I do that is good? Um, given the situation. And of course, the situation is, you know, we are terribly subject, human beings are, to all sorts of catastrophes. We've learned that, if anything, over the last year, right? Um, and worse, far worse catastrophes than we have suffered, you know, can occur uh, in, in human life. And so God wants you focusing on how do I you know, do good, how do I seek the good in this present moment, as we talked about last week, the devils want you thinking about, uh, you know, am I going to go to war? What's going to happen? Who will die? Will I die? Right. Um, Lewis had personal experience of this. He fought, as I discussed a while back, he fought in the First World War. He wanted to fight in the second, uh, but could not. Um, in fact, he was injured in the First World War, um, to which he deployed on his 19th birthday, which is a pretty remarkable, imagine being 19 and on your 19th birthday deploying into the First World War. He was injured, so he did serve his country. He had fought. Uh, he had done military service. And so all of the things, just like the prayer life stuff that we talked about last week, where he knew about prayer life because he himself was coming back to faith, right? Um, he knew about war and he knew about the experience of thinking about war and wanting to go to war or not to go to war. Um, and so there is a passage here, a, a, a brilliant passage about the nature of courage. Um, and this is much, much later as the war is, is progressing. Screwtape says, hatred is best combined with fear. Cowardice, alone of all the vices, is purely painful, horrible to anticipate, horrible to feel, horrible to remember. Hatred has its pleasures. It is therefore often the compensation by which a frightened ma man reimburses himself for the miseries of fear. The more he fears, the more he will hate. And hatred is also a great anodyne for shame. To make a deep wound in his charity, you should therefore first defeat his courage. Now, this is a ticklish business. We have made men proud of most vices, but not of cowardice. Whenever we have almost succeeded in doing so, the enemy permits a war or an earthquake or some other calamity, and at once courage becomes so obviously lovely and important even in human eyes that all our work is undone, and there is still at least one vice of which they feel genuine shame. Now, this is really important for us to hear, and it, you could almost miss it. The enemy permits a war or an earthquake or some other calamity. I have talked about this before. It's one of the hardest things to accept or to deal with or to contemplate, um, but it's there. It's in scripture. In Isaiah, in the prophecy of Isaiah, God says, I do good, create good, and create disaster. Um, this is part of, you know, the, the biblical vision of how God works that permitting these terrible catastrophes, you know, even though it's harsh and bitter medicine, one of the effects it has is to make reality more plain to us. And one of the realities it makes plain to us is that courage is an ineluctable good. You cannot wish courage away. You cannot wish the need for manly endeavor away. And maybe this is something for us to sort of realize about this moment. When I said at the beginning, right, that we are in so terribly in need of courage. Well, maybe it's a step in the right direction that we realize that, right? Maybe now that we know we need courage, we can get about the business of cultivating it. And Lewis has some good stuff in here about this. He says, 
The danger of inducing cowardice in our patients, therefore, is lest we produce real self-knowledge and self-loathing with consequent repentance and humility. And in fact, in the last war, thousands of humans, by discovering their own cowardice, discovered the whole moral world for the first time. I wonder if that applies to anybody listening to my voice right now, right? By discovering your own cowardice, you discover the whole moral world for the first time. I've had that experience. I've, I've realized, wow, all of my big ideas are nothing because I don't have the stones to do X, Y, or Z. And the next thing that you do is you do X, Y, or Z, right? You speak out about the thing that you find abhorrent or you go and you, you know, take that risk of, on, on a business or on a, like a workout or anything, right? Like discovering your own cowardice is a way to repentance and a way to discovering the reality of the moral universe. Um, he's saying that this happened in the last war, that is World War One, right? Remember, this, this book takes place during World War II. Um, in peace, we can make many of them ignore good and evil entirely. In danger, the issue is forced upon them in a guise to which even we cannot blind them. This is happening to us right now, right? That's one of the reasons why I wanted to read this book. Uh, there is here a cruel dilemma before us. If we promoted justice and charity among men, we should be playing directly into the enemy's hands, but if we guide them to the opposite behavior, this sooner or later produces, for he permits it to produce, a war or a revolution, and the undisguisable issue of cowardice or courage awakens thousands of men from moral stupor. This, indeed, is probably one of the enemy's motives for creating a dangerous world, a world in which moral issues really come to the point. I've said this before, but if you are in despair about the situation of America or the West more generally right now, um, you haven't gotten this message yet. Maybe you have an idea about the world as broken, but somewhere in your heart you thought, and I know this, I, you know, I, I confess to this myself, right? Somewhere in your heart you thought that things could go great and you could have a guaranteed happy ride, right? There are no guarantees of a happy ride. What you are promised is trouble in this world, right? And, and, Sometimes when we have a year or a set of years like we're having right now, you know, uh, you come up against the realities of this in a way that maybe you had been able to wish away before. And that it's a hard, hard blessing, but it may be a blessing. He sees, he that is the enemy, God, sees as well as you do that courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point, which means at the point of highest reality. A chastity or honesty or mercy which yields to danger will be chaste or honest or merciful only on conditions. Pilate was merciful till it became risky. Now, this is encapsulating a lot of what we have talked about about courage before, right? That courage is the form of every virtue at the testing point. And that makes it a morally complicated thing because you can show some virtues, that is some excellence, um, directed in the wrong way, right? Um, and not all excellences are moral excellences, as we've discussed before. You can be very strong. That's an excellence. It's obviously admirable, but you can use your strength to prey upon the weak. You might even do so in a way that requires you to show a certain form of courage that is not to back down when people threaten you. And yet, nevertheless, that's an evil thing, right? So courage presents a moral quandary. Um, and there are a number of texts that get at it. We talked about Vertu in Machiavelli, which, which sort of gets at some of this. Vertu is not necessarily always a morally good thing, but it's a necessary thing. Um, and there's a, a platonic dialogue, which really, uh, I think, digs into it called the Lakeys. Um, the sort of idea of this dialogue is that Socrates, the great barefoot sage, um, is talking with Lakeys and Nikias, who are two generals from the Peloponnesian War. That was the uh, war. This, this sort of we talk about the the classical Athenian period being bracketed by the Persian Wars on the one side that lead us into the fifth century, and then um, throughout the latter half and up to the end of the fifth century, we have the Peloponnesian War. So Lakes and Nicias are Peloponnesian War generals, and they're talking. Um, about courage for the benefit, essentially, of Lysimachus and Milesius, um, who are talking about whether they should have their sons trained to fight in armor, whether they should train their sons for courage. Um, there are a few platonic dialogues. Some would argue that all platonic dialogues are like this. I don't think this is quite right. But there are a few platonic dialogues which end in a genuine 
uh, kind of what the Greeks would call aporia, that is a sort of impasse. Well, we're not actually sure if we've resolved this question. I think the Lakeys is one of them because it puzzles specifically over, well, if courage is a good thing, then how can it be used for evil or can it be used for evil? Um, so I'm going to read now a few passages from the Lakeys, again, in the interest of sort of raising some of these issues that I think Lewis would have been thinking about um, as he, he wrote and discussed these things, which come over very easily and breezily on the surface of his work. It's very enjoyable, um, but it's fun also, I think, to, to like peel back the layers and see where things come from. I have an urgent and kind of time-sensitive message for you guys, which is that there's only one more week left to become a Young Heretics VIP for our special early reduced rate. It currently costs $4.99 a month. The Locals community is a place where people who love this show can talk more deeply about it, can get together and get to know one another outside the reach of big tech. I hate big tech censorship. That is why I went on Locals, created this Young Heretics community. If you become a VIP, you get all kinds of extra stuff. You get the episodes a week in advance. You get like workout tips that I'm posting on there. We share pictures of like our bookshelves and talk about what we're reading. It's all really cool stuff and it's a way to dig more deeply into these topics that we're talking about. I write articles that you can only get if you're a VIP. I, you know, do live Q and A's and all this stuff. Plus you can be in the mailbag. So you can currently become a VIP for $4.99 a month. That was a special promo when we launched the thing. That's only going to last for one more week. After that, it's going to be seven bucks a month. So get in there under the gate, go to youngheretics.com slash locals to sign up as a VIP for that special $4.99 a month price. I would love to see you there. Uh, it would be great if you could become part of this Young Heretics VIP group. All right. Now, so here's Socrates discussing with Lakeys the subject of courage. Socrates, this is uh, Stephanos page 192 for those of you following along at home. Um, now try and tell me on your part, Lakeys, about courage. What faculty is it? the same whether in pleasure or in pain or in any of the things which we said just now it was to be found that has been singled out by the name of courage. So he's saying in all of these different situations, you can show courage and pleasure and pain and all these things. But what's the common thread? And that's always a tactic of platonic definition, right? It's to find the common thread in all these different situations so that you get to the essence of the thing you're looking at. So what's courage? Um, well, then, like he says, I take it to be a certain endurance of the soul if I am to speak of the natural quality that appears in all of these situations, um, an endurance of the soul. Socrates says, why, of course we must, if we are each to answer the other's actual question. Now it appears to me that by no means endurance, as I conceive it, can appear to you to be courage. And my grounds for thinking so are these. I am almost certain, Lakeys, that you rank courage among the nobler qualities. And Lakey says, nay, among the noblest, you may be quite certain. And endurance joined with wisdom is noble and good, like he says very much so. Socrates says, but what of it when joined with folly? Is it not, on the contrary, hurtful and mischievous? Like he says, yes. And Socrates says, can you say that such a thing is noble when it is both mischievous and hurtful? Like he says, not with any justice. Socrates says, then you will not admit that such an endurance is courage, seeing that it is not noble, whereas courage is a noble quality. So this is, you know, is, is courage noble? Is, is, if courage is endurance, but endurance can be used for ignoble things, well, then is courage a virtue, right? But we know that courage is a virtue. So we're, we're sort of puzzling around. It's like, you know, once you put one part in place, the other part falls out of place, right? And so Socrates and Lakeys are kind of talking around this. Um, and, and Socrates says, so by your account, then wise endurance will be courage. So only courage, which is used in the service of wisdom. Um, or endurance, rather, which is used in the service of wisdom. And Socrates says, Now let us see in what it is wise, in all things, whether great or small. For instance, if a man endures in spending money wisely because he knows that by spending he will gain more, would you call him courageous? Like he says, On my word, not I. Or what do you call it in the case of a doctor who, when his son or anyone else is suffering from inflammation of the lungs and begs for something to eat or drink, inflexibly and enduringly refuses? That is no case of courage in any sense either, says Lakey. So they go on like this for a while. And this, this uh, sense that we have that courage involves holding fast against threats, right, um, sort of 
falls apart under Socrates' deft examination. And they kind of accuse, eventually they accuse Socrates of just wanting to pick apart any definition that you give. But that's kind of the point, right? That courage is this sort of slippery thing to really nail down. Um, and yet we know that without it, no virtue is possible. It's basically the ground upon which uh, all virtue stands, as Lewis says in uh, the passages that we read earlier from the screw tape letters. Um, so there's one more part of this dialogue before we leave it, and this is slightly later, Stephanus page 199, um, and now he's talking to Nicias. Socrates says, um, our question is about what courage is as a whole. And he says, on your own showing, Nic Nicias, it appears that courage is knowledge, not merely of what is to be dreaded and what dared, but practically a knowledge concerning all goods and evils at every stage. Such is your present account of what courage must be. What do you say to this new version, Nicias? I accept it, Socrates. Socrates says, now, do you think, my excellent friend, there could be anything wanting to the virtue of a man who knew all good things and all about their production in the present, the future, and the past, and all about evil things likewise? Do you suppose that such a man could be lacking in temperance or justice and holiness when he alone has the gift of taking due precaution in his dealings with gods and men as he regards what is to be dreaded and what is not, and of procuring good things owing to his knowledge of the right behavior toward them? I think, Socrates, there is something in what you say. What they're working toward then, essentially, is, well, if courage is just knowing what to fear and what not to fear, um, then it's just wisdom, right? Then there's nothing to distinguish it. So either courage is everything or it's nothing, right? This is this perplexity that the, the dialogue, I mean, we'll do a whole episode on the dialogue itself at some point, um, but just to sort of bring up this issue, right, that courage is essentially the, it's like the varnish over a coat of paint, right? It's the thing that lets you see everything else more clearly. Um, and Lewis dramatizes this in the question whether to do your duty in war. If you don't have the courage to do that duty, then none of your other virtues are really real. And so it's essentially the kind of ground or the basis um, upon which all other virtues fall. So let's keep reading a little bit in that same passage from the Screwtape Letters. This is, again, chapter 29. He says, as to the actual technique of temptations to cowardice, not much need be said. The main point is that precautions have a tendency to increase fear. The precautions publicly enjoined on your patient, however, soon become a matter of routine, and this effect disappears. What you must do is to keep running in his mind, side by side with the conscious intention of doing his duty, the vague idea of all sorts of things he can do or not do inside the framework of the duty, which seem to make him a little safer. Get his mind off the simple rule, I've got to stay here and do so-and-so, into a series of imaginary lifelines. If A happened, though I very much hope it won't, I could do B, and if the worst came to the worst, I could always do C. If this sounds familiar to you, you are right, right? I mean, this idea that precautions increase fear, right? The more precautions you layer on, the more you start to realize, well, you start to think rather, well, there are, you know, exceptions to the rule of I must stand up if it harms me too much or if it would be bad for my career or, you know, all of these little exceptions or these excuses which seem so reasonable. This is the devil's hypnosis that I was talking about, right? Oh, yeah, like, I guess I don't really have to unless this happens. But if that happens, then I can, you know, th this kind of uh, escapism, um, which is the nature essentially of cowardice and can feel as if you are not betraying your duty when even when you really are, right? And this is how by soft degrees we went from 15 days to slow the spread, right? Well, we'll just make that little concession all the way up to like years of lockdown and you can't take your mask off even if, even if you get vaccinated, right? This, this, Precaution after precaution after precaution, um, no, no individual one of which seems like a failure of courage, but together, right, they come, they, they amount to this entire capitulation. This is how satanic, satanic hypnosis works. Superstitions, if not recognized as such, can be awakened. The point is to keep him feeling that he has something other than the enemy and courage the enemy supplies to fall back on, so that what was intended to be a total commitment to duty becomes honeycombed all through with little unconscious reservations. By building up a series of imaginary expedients to prevent the worst coming to the worst, you may produce at that level of his will, which he is not aware of, a determination that the worst shall not come to the worst. Then, at the moment of real terror, rush it out into his nerves and muscles, and you may get the fatal act done before he knows what you're about. For remember, the act of cowardice is all that matters. The emotion of fear is in itself no sin, and, though we enjoy it, does us no good. 
I love that line, honeycombed all through with little unconscious reservations. It's so pertinent to how we ourselves, I think, have been gulled into losing our courage, into thinking that courage was not an essential virtue. And if there's one argument I'm making here is that courage is the essential virtue, even if it's not always used in virtuous ways, right? But without courage, without courage, there is no other virtue. It's the ground upon which all virtue stands. This is all resolved in one of Lewis's most beautiful passages, and that is the ultimate salvation of the patient. Because in fact, he does do his duty. And this causes terrible anguish to the devils and reveals ultimately the full nature of what they have always been. Um, and so let's read now this, this beautiful portion in which, in fact, the patient dies on the battlefield. Hey, if you're enjoying this show, one great way to make sure that you never miss an episode is hit the subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. It can be on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google, whatever. Just hit that subscribe button because we do put out new episodes every week and you won't want to miss them. Also, if you think this is a message that deserves to be shared, and I really believe it does, that's why I'm here, right, is to spread the joy of learning about Western culture and digging deep into these texts and works of art, right? If you think this should be shared, it really, really helps to leave a five-star review. Again, wherever you're listening, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever, just give us a five-star review and help people discover Young Heretics and be part of this great adventure. Okay, so this is chapter 31. My dear, my very dear Wormwood, my poppet, my pig's knee, how mistakenly, now that all is lost, you come whimpering to ask me whether the terms of affection in which I address you meant nothing from the beginning. Far from it. Rest assured, my love for you and your love for me are as like as two peas. I have always desired you as you pitiful fool, desired me. The difference is that I am stronger. I think they will give you to me now, or a bit of you. Love you? Why, yes, as dainty a morsel as ever I grew fat on. We're going to come back to this, but this is the, the full ultimate logic of hell, right? That everybody just exists to consume everybody else. And dev devils want to consume humans, but they also want to consume each other. And strength is the only law. He says, you have let a soul slip through your fingers. The howl of sharpened famine for that loss re-echoes at this moment through all the levels of the kingdom of noise down to the very throne itself. It makes me mad to think of it. How well I know what happened at the instant when they snatched him from you. There was a sudden clearing of his eyes, was there not? As he saw you for the first time and recognized the part you had had in him and knew you had it no longer. Just think and let it be the beginning of your agony, what he felt at that moment, as if a scab had fallen from an old sore, as if he were emerging from a hideous, shell-like tetter, as if he shuffled off for good and all a defiled, wet, clinging garment. By hell, it is misery enough to see them in their mortal days, taking off dirtied and uncomfortable clothes, and splashing in hot water and giving little grunts of pleasure, stretching their eased limbs. What then of this final stripping, this complete cleansing? He's talking about the stripping off of sin, right, in this moment when you come at last uh, through the the horror of, of death and ultimately into heaven, right? And the more one thinks about it, says Screwtape, the worse it becomes. He got through so easily. No gradual misgivings, no doctor's sentence, no nursing home, no operating theater, no false hopes of life. Sheer, instantaneous liberation. And he's talking here about death, death and war, right? One moment it seemed to be all our world. The scream of bombs, the fall of houses, the stink and taste of high explosive on the lips and in the lungs, the feet burning with weariness, the heart cold with horrors, the brain rearing, reeling, the legs aching. Next moment, all this was gone. Gone like a bad dream, never again to be of any account. Defeated, outmaneuvered fool, did you mark how naturally, as if he'd been born for it, the earth-born vermin entered the new life, how all his doubts became, in the twinkling of an eye, ridiculous. I know what the creature was saying to itself. Yes, of course, it was always like this. All horrors have followed the same course, getting worse and worse and forcing you into a kind of bottleneck till at the very moment when you thought you must be crushed, behold, you were out of the narrows and all was suddenly well. 
The extraction hurt more and more, and then the tooth was out. The dream became a nightmare, and then you woke. You die and die, and then you are beyond death. How could I ever have doubted it? And as it chokes me up a little bit, it's, it's uh, you know, again, it's written in this oblique way, this negative way about uh, how horrible it is that this is all happening. But it's a description of what courage truly leads to, right? That when, in fact, you stand your ground in the faith that what you are doing is right, even in the moment when it all feels awful and hopeless, when the bombs are falling around you, when it seems as if your effort is completely in vain, in that moment, you are potentially right at the point where things are about to get better. And even if that is in eternity, right, in the other world, still it is infinitely worth it to make that stand. It's a remarkable passage, and it speaks perfectly to the thing that, that the only thing, right, that counteracts fear, because we do feel fear, right? Courage, as I think John Wayne said, right, is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. We all feel the fear of this moment. We all fear the anxiety about what might happen. We all feel the horror at what is happening to our country. And yet, and yet, we know, we can see, because of the realities of our, of our struggles, we can see that courage is a good and that exerting it in the service of the good is the highest testing point of all virtue. And so you stand your ground and you wait and you wait no matter how bad it gets. Um, and so then, right, we have this wonderful description of, of heaven um, and of what happens to the soul and what happens to the demons. So we'll close, we'll sort of close out by, by thinking about this, right? Um, he says, as he saw you, as the patient saw Wormwood, he also saw them with a capital T. I know how it was. You reeled back dizzy and blinded, more hurt by them than he had ever been by bombs. The degradation of it, that this thing of earth and slime could stand upright and converse with spirits before whom you, a spirit, could only cower. Perhaps you had hoped that the awe and strangeness of it would dash his joy, but that is the cursed thing. The gods are strange to mortal eyes, and yet they are not strange. He had no faintest conception till that very hour of how they would look, and even doubted their existence. But when he saw them, he knew that he had always known them, and realized what part each one of them had played at many an hour in his life when he had supposed himself alone, so that now he could say to them one by one, not, who are you? But so, it was you all the time. All that they were and said at this meeting woke memories. The dim consciousness of friends about him which had haunted his solitudes from infancy was now at last explained. That central music in every pure experience which had always just evaded memory was now at last recovered. Recognition made him free of their company almost before the limbs of his corpse became quiet. Only you were left outside. And this is this uh, theme, again, that we've talked about in Lewis's work, right? That the intimations of what heaven is are in all of our myths, all of our kind of, uh, the things that we see, as Paul says, through a glass darkly, the stories we tell, the visions we have um, out of the corner of our eye of, of things that, you know, that are real in fairy tales, right? Of what The things that fairy tales tell us that we know in our hearts to be true, even if they're not literally fact. Actual, right? Um, all of this is now confirmed, and he not only saw them, he saw him, this animal, this thing begotten in a bed, could look on him. What is blinding, suffocating fire to you is now cool light to him, is clarity itself, and wears the form of a man. You would like, if you could, to interpret the patient's prostration in the presence, his self-abhorrence and utter knowledge of his sins, yes, Wormwood, a clearer knowledge even than yours, on the analogy of your own choking and paralyzing sensations when you encounter the deadly air that breathes from the heart of heaven. But it's all nonsense. Pains he may still have to encounter, but they embrace those pains. They would not barter them for any earthly pleasure. All the delights of sense or heart or intellect with which you could once have tempted him, even the delight of virtue itself now seem to him in comparison but as the half-nauseous attractions of a rattled harlot would seem to a man who hears that his true beloved whom he has loved all his life and whom he had believed to be dead is alive and even now at his door. So he brings it back there in the last passage to what we talked about last week, right? That, that 
this sort of shadow versions of pleasure that hell offers us, the degraded, you know, it's not that they're, it's not that they're too pleasurable or that we take too much pleasure in the temptations of hell. It's that they're not pleasurable enough, right? Is that the, the, the things that we enjoy in this world are these reflections, these distant emanations of the true purity of encountering the good and the true and the beautiful in heaven, in God, right? Um, it's a, it's a remarkable, I mean, it's almost wisdom literature. Wisdom literature is this term for sort of, you know, things like the book of Job that uh, compress into these stories um, a, an entire vision of the moral universe. Screw tape letters is, is kind of like wisdom literature in this way. And it, it also shows, you know, that idea that only Wormwood is left out, right? We, we also finally get a, tr a vision into the true nature of of hell, which again, as I said, is just pure will to power, um, pure eating one another alive. And, um, and this vision of degradation, uh, which actually we've had earlier on, I'm going to close with just one more passage um, and then with, with Milton as a kind of juxtaposition as I've been doing um, to show, you know, the, the vision that Lewis has of, of what devils actually are. And um, he talked about this also um, in his preface to Paradise Lost. But here there's this funny little moment in chapter 22 at the end, right? Uh, he says, in the heat of composition, I find that I have inadvertently allowed myself to assume the form of a large centipede. I am accordingly dictating the rest to my secretary. Now that the transformation is complete, I recognize it as a periodical phenomenon. Some rumor of it has reached the humans, and a distorted account of it appears in the poet Milton, with the ridiculous addition that such changes of shape are a punishment imposed on us by the enemy. A more modern writer, some with, someone with a name like Shaw, has, however, grasped the truth. Transformation proceeds from within, and is a glorious manifestation of that life force which our father would worship if he worshipped anything but himself. In my present form, I feel even more anxious to see you, to unite you to myself in an indissoluble embrace. And that, of course, is the twisted satanic version of love, which is really just consumption. This idea that the devils and Satan himself, right, are, are periodically transformed into um, serpentine forms, uh, not because it's their will, they're using it to tempt Eve or whatever, but because, in fact, it's the degradation that comes with rebelling against God. This is indeed from Milton. And so I will close just by reading a delicious passage from Paradise Lost, book 10. And in this passage, Satan is reporting to his underdemons uh, that he has successfully tempted Adam and Eve, and he expects this hero's welcome back in hell. So he's given this speech about how great he is and what he did, right? He says, so having said, a while he stood, expecting their universal shout and high applause to feel, fill his ear, when contrary, he hears on all sides, from innumerable tongues, a dismal universal hiss, the sound of public scorn. He wondered, but not long had leisure, wondering at himself now more. His visage drawn he felt to sharp and spare, his arms clung to his ribs, his legs entwining each other, till supplanted, down he fell, a monstrous serpent on his belly prone, reluctant but in vain. A greater power now ruled him, punished, in the shape he sinned, according to his doom. He would have spoke, but hiss for hiss, returned with forked tongue, to forked tongue, for now we're all transformed alike to serpents as accessories to his bold riot. Dreadful was the din of hissing through the hole, thick swarming now with complicated monsters, head and tail, scorpion and asp, and amphis bainadire, serastes horned, hydrus and elopstria, there's names of different kinds of, of serpentine creature, right? And dipsus, not so thick swarmed once the soil but dropped with blood of gorgon or the isle offusa, but still greatest he, the midst now dragon grown, larger than whole, the sun engendered in the Pythian veil on slime, huge python, and his power no less he seemed, above the rest still to retain. They all him followed, issuing forth to the open field, where all yet left of that revolted rout, heaven fallen, in, starve, in station stood or just array, sublime with expectation, when to see in triumph, issuing forth their glorious chief, they saw, but other sight instead, a crowd of ugly serpents, horror on them fell, and horrid sympathy for what they saw, they felt themselves now changing, down their arms, down fell both spear and shield, down they as fast, and the dire hiss renewed, and the dire form, catched by contagion, like in punishment, as in their crime. This is the phenomenon that I was talking about 
earlier that when you rebel against reality, you think that you can change reality, but in fact, reality changes you. And it's, of course, a heightened sort of, uh, you know, quasi mythological version of it. Um, but you see it all the time when people say like, being fat is healthy, right? It doesn't make you healthy. It just makes you fat to say that, right? And so reality asserts itself over you, even when you try to assert your will uh, over reality. I close there, uh, but with the reminder, right, that this uh, whole episode has been about courage and has been about the very, the, the realities that that crisis makes known to us, right? And Lewis stresses this, I'm going to stress it too, right? When you are in crisis, you cannot wish away reality the way that Satan wants to, the way that Satan wants you to, the way that we all want to when we're in a, a hard time, right? There's no escaping the need for courage. There's no getting out of it. There's no reasoning your way out of it. We are at a crisis moment. Um, and it's not like, you know, you are going to save the world. But as I have stressed throughout both of these episodes, right, your decision today, tomorrow, this moment is the minuscule stuff of which the battle between heaven and hell is made. And so your decision tomorrow, either to speak up in class, either to protest the lockdowns, either to say what's on your mind, even though you think it's not socially acceptable, right? Or, or your decision not to because of fear, right? Those decisions will all accumulate into the reality, the spiritual reality of your life. So don't waste it. Thank you for joining me on this two-part exploration of the screw tape letters. Let's do the mailbag. I want to let you guys know that that launch offer for your Young Heretics merch to get it at a 10% discount is expiring in three weeks. You have three more weeks to use the offer code LAUNCH at youngheretics.com slash shop and you get 10% off all of this awesome merch. It has been so cool to see this roll out. People have been posting selfies wearing this shirt that says we're reading Homer and screw you, right? Y'all look great in those. Let me say there's shirts, there's the hat, there's the uh, stickers that you can put on your laptop and piss off your professor, right? All of this stuff is awesome. You go to youngheretics.com slash shop. You have three more weeks to use the offer code launch and get a 10% discount. When you do, when you get yourself, tweet a selfie at me and I will totally repost them because I love that. I love to see that you're uh, getting into this merch and enjoying it. Um, one more time, you have three more weeks to use the offer code launch for 10% off youngheretics.com slash shop. Okay, so Mailbag questions come to me through Locals. If you are not on Locals, get on it. It is so much fun to be in this Young Heretics VIP community. Um, you can sign up by going to youngheretics.com slash locals and becoming a Young Heretics VIP. You get really a lot of sort of benefits that are exclusive. You get articles that I write just for locals. Um, and the most important thing is that we enter into these deep conversations there uh, where we take the themes of these episodes forward. Um, you get the episodes themselves a week in advance without ads. And uh, you get to be in the mailbag. You get to ask these questions. Um, so here's one from Mike. And it's related to everything that I've been talking about today. Harkening back to the G.K. Chesterton episode, how does voting with your feet relate to localism? While people must do what they feel is best for their financial, social, ethical situation, wouldn't the ability to move to greener pastures be detrimental to building local community? This is a great question, right? So he's talking, Mike is talking about the fact that I've been advocating standing your ground. I've been advocating, you know, doing what is right uh, and not having no substitute for courage. And yet, right, a lot of people, myself included, have relocated out of these sort of semi-destroyed, hyper-blue progressive cities into a place like I live now in Nashville, where I feel that there is a uh, firmer footing on which to build a life that can withstand the, some of the assaults of what I call the ruling class. Um... And so Mike is saying, well, if you can just do that, right, if you can just cut and run, how are you ever going to put down roots? How are you ever going to build the local institutions that we need uh, in order to reinvigorate American life? Because I've argued several times that really what we're up to now um, is getting involved at the local and the state level and then building that up into a national, into a national campaign, a national revival, um, not of like Republicans. I don't really care about the Republican Party per se. I care about the Republican Party because it's been the vehicle for a lot of the sanity. And I think the Democrats have been like fully captured by the radical woke left. But really what I want is a, an American revival of Americanism and of Western pride, right? Um, and I believe that to do that, we, you know, it starts with you, right? Like the first point of, uh, of contention, as I've been saying throughout these episodes, right, uh, between heaven and hell is your soul. And then you build that out into your family and into your community and into your life. Mike is saying, 
how do you do that if you are what has been called like an anywhere, if you can just go anywhere, work remotely, all this stuff? Um, valid, really valid question. Here's my answer. You cannot run from the problems that are going on in the world right now. They will, they will come for you. But it may be time, it may be right for you to find a location in which you can make a strong stand. And if you find yourself doing this every time things go wrong, then you know that you have just adopted that as a defense tactic. But if you are doing something like uh, a strategic retreat, which Jesus often does in the Gospels, actually, there's a word, a Greek word, anachoreo, which means to like draw back in, in battle when, you know, you need to shore up your defenses, right? Um, it may be that the place where you currently find yourself um, is so captured by critical race theory, by, you know, uh, by mismanagement, by misgovernment, um, that that you personally, right, will be of best service to God and family and country um, by finding a place where you can build. Look, a lot of places, here's a good example. A lot of people in these like hyper inflated cities, like can't buy a house and owning land is so important, you know, and that's something we're working on out here in Nashville. And we can do that because the economy is not being choked to death by progressive mismanagement, right? Um, owning land, getting married, forming a life, right? You need to be somewhere where you can do those grown-up things because they are the rudiments of the kind of localism that I'm describing. Now, maybe you're in a position where you can do those things in, in a progressive city. And if you can, like, God bless you, more power to you. Fight back from within. Um, but not everybody is called to that. And you have to do the thing, as you say, that makes sense for your particular situation, how you can be most effective in the revitalization of America and the West. Hope that answers your question. Thanks for asking it. One more time, if you want to be in the mailbag, go to youngheretics.com slash locals and become a Young Heretics VIP. It is my honor and my privilege to be with you. As always, if you like this show, you will also like the work that we do at the Claremont Institute. We publish the Claremont Review of Books, which is a print journal, and The American Mind, which is online. You can find them both at claremontreviewbooks.com and the American and AmericanMind.org. You can also donate to help support the work that we do defending the American ideals at Claremont.org slash donate. If you do, let them know you heard about us through Young Heretics. It is my pleasure to be with you. Thank you for joining me. I will see you next week for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters.